I'd been working as a park ranger in Yosemite for almost 15 years by the time the incident in 1998 happened. In all my years patrolling those woods, I'd seen and heard a lot of strange things. The deep wilderness has a way of getting under your skin, of making the impossible feel possible, especially when you're out there alone, miles from any sign of civilization. But nothing, and I mean nothing, prepared me for what happened that year. My name is David Reed, and I was one of the senior rangers stationed in Yosemite National Park back in 98. Most people who visit Yosemite are drawn to its majestic landscapes, the towering granite cliffs, the ancient sequoias, and the breathtaking waterfalls. It's a place of peace and natural beauty. But the truth is, the wilderness can be a dark and unforgiving place, a place where things go wrong, sometimes in ways you can't explain. The incident started like many other search and rescue missions we'd handled before. A group of three experienced hikers, Jake Collins, his girlfriend Rachel Patterson, and their mutual friend Chris Miller, had gone missing. They had set off on a four-day backpacking trip through the less-traveled backcountry. They were experienced, well-equipped, and had submitted their planned route to the Park Service. So when they failed to check in after their expected return, alarm bells went off. It was Rachel's sister who first reported them missing, and after 48 hours without a sign, we launched the search. My colleague, Frank Harris, and I were among the first responders. We were assigned to search a remote area called Tenaya Canyon, an area that most visitors stay away from due to its treacherous terrain. Locals call it the Bermuda Triangle of Yosemite. It has this reputation for strange occurrences, people getting lost, equipment failing, sudden rock falls with no apparent cause. The first two days of the search were uneventful. We hiked through miles of dense forest, up steep rocky slopes, and along narrow ridges. We called out their names, set up camp, and continued on. But by the third day, something felt wrong. We hadn't found any sign of the hikers. No gear, no footprints, no campsite remnants, nothing. It was like they had vanished into thin air. On the morning of the fourth day, we finally found something. Deep in the canyon, near a steep drop-off, we came across Jake's backpack. It was shredded, torn apart as though some wild animal had gotten to it. But that wasn't what unsettled me the most. The odd part was the way the pack had been abandoned. It wasn't just tossed aside or dropped in a panic. It was sitting upright, carefully propped against a tree, almost like it had been placed there. Dave, take a look at this, Frank called, kneeling down by a patch of disturbed earth a few feet from the pack. I walked over and saw what he was looking at blood. A lot of it. Streaks of dried crimson smeared across the dirt and grass, leading toward the edge of the cliff. But there was no body. No sign of where the blood trail ended. Think they fell? I asked, though the drop was so far down that if they had, we would have heard something. Maybe, Frank said, but his voice was tight, strained. He didn't believe it either. We radioed for help and continued our search spreading out to cover more ground. The feeling of unease that had been creeping over me since we found the backpack only grew stronger. There was something off about the whole scene, something I couldn't quite put my finger on, but I knew it wasn't good. Later that afternoon, we found Rachel, or rather, what was left of her. Her body was lying in a shallow creek, her clothes soaked through, her limbs bent at unnatural angles, her face was contorted in a grotesque expression of terror, her mouth wide open as if she had died screaming. But it wasn't the sight of her broken body that made my stomach turn. It was the wounds. Huge, deep gashes covered her torso and legs, too precise to have been made by any animal I'd ever encountered in these woods. They almost looked like they'd been made by claws, but not of any creature I knew of. The cuts were too clean, too deliberate. We radioed for backup, and soon, more rangers and rescue teams arrived. The search intensified, but by the end of the fifth day, we still hadn't found Jake or Chris. We camped that night near where we had found Rachel's body. The mood among the team was grim. I couldn't shake the image of her face from my mind. The terror in her eyes. 
It was like she had seen something far worse than just a fall or an attack by a bear or mountain lion. That night, something happened that I can still barely bring myself to think about. It must have been around two or three in the morning when I woke up to the sound of movement just outside my tent. At first, I thought it was Frank or one of the other rangers, but then I heard a low, guttural growl. My heart leapt into my throat. I grabbed my flashlight and unzipped the tent, stepping out into the cold night air. I shone the light around, but there was nothing. No animals, no people. Just the dark shapes of trees and rocks surrounding our camp. But the air felt heavy, oppressive, like something was watching me from just beyond the light. Suddenly, a branch snapped behind me. I whipped around, my flashlight beam catching something, just for a split second. Something tall, impossibly tall and humanoid. Its skin was pale, almost translucent, and its eyes. God, its eyes. They were glowing, an unnatural red, staring right at me. I blinked, and it was gone. For a moment, I stood there frozen, my mind struggling to make sense of what I had just seen. Had I imagined it? Was it just the exhaustion and stress playing tricks on me? But then I heard it again. That growl, low and rumbling, coming from the direction where we had found Rachel's body. I ran back to my tent and zipped it up as fast as I could. My heart was pounding in my chest, and I could feel the sweat on the back of my neck, despite the cold. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. None of us did. The next morning, I didn't say anything about what I'd seen. I didn't want the others to think I was losing it, but I could tell from the looks on their faces that I wasn't the only one who had heard something in the night. We kept searching, but by the end of the week, we had found nothing. No sign of Jake or Chris. It was like they had vanished into thin air. The official report said that the hikers likely got lost, that Rachel had fallen and succumbed to her injuries, and that the others were presumed dead. It was ruled a tragic accident, and that was the end of it. But that wasn't the end for me. A few weeks later, I received a call from a man named Dr. Richard Cole, a professor of folklore and mythology who had been studying strange disappearances in national parks. He had heard about the incident in Yosemite and wanted to talk to me. At first, I didn't see the point, but something about his voice, a quiet urgency, made me agree. When we met, he showed me photos, articles, and reports from other cases across the country. People disappearing in national parks, bodies found with strange wounds, accounts of tall, pale figures seen in the woods, just like the one I had glimpsed that night. He called them Wendigos, creatures from Native American folklore spirits of the wilderness that devour human flesh and grow more powerful with each kill. I didn't want to believe him. I didn't want to believe that something like that could exist. But deep down, I knew there was more to what happened in 1998 than just a simple accident. I tried to move on, to bury the memory of that night, but it still haunts me. Whenever I close my eyes, I can still see those glowing red eyes staring at me from the darkness, still hear that low growl. I left Yosemite a few years later. I couldn't stay, not after what I'd seen. But the forest stays with you, even when you're far from it. And I can't help but wonder, what if it's still out there, waiting for its next victim? Waiting for someone like me to let their guard down to make a mistake? Because whatever killed those hikers in 1998, it wasn't human. And it's still out there in the dark, where no one can hear you scream. My name's Dean. I used to be a ranger of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park located in Northern Carolina. I was guiding a group of Spanish tourists, and none of them knew English. Our communication was more than terrible. I left them near a river returning to base. Two hours went by, and I returned to see if everybody was fine, and if nobody was lost. We went back to a safe place. The afternoon was turning into night, and being there would be extremely dangerous. We arrived, and one of the tourists told me that we'd forgotten somebody, a young woman with a notebook. He told me she was trying to collect some data about birds and insects. Immediately, I went to search for her. I took everything I had before going. 
I told everybody to stay there, and I'd be back in a half-hour flat. The forest was dark. The insect noises. I heard her distressed call near the river. I arrived there, and she was being attacked by bats. I grabbed my gun, firing several shots into the air. The bats fled, and the woman had some superficial bite wounds. She panicked and fainted. I waited for her to recover, then took her back to the safe place so I could give her first aid. We were walking. She was having some difficulties, even if I was helping her. The forest was dark, and suddenly it began to rain as we walked harder. Some hours passed and we had arrived. The other tourists were waiting for a return and became shocked at what had happened. I gave her first aid. All the tourists asked to get back to the city. I told them that would not be possible in that condition. It was raining a lot, the track was wet, and probably we would all suffer accidents. I told everybody to sleep, and when the morning appeared, the young woman was dead. Her body had more wounds than last night. An old man had some bite wounds on his left arm and did not wake up. His wife had tried to wake him, but when he finally woke, he had a severe heart attack and died. The old woman in tears the other two. Tourists tried to calm her down and asked me what happened. After hours of searching, night came, and this time I was completely alone. Five years of working as a ranger of this park had given me the knowledge to be prepared for anything, or so I thought. At midnight, I heard a strange noise, sounding like a huge airplane or something. I decided to go see what was happening. I arrived and saw something that nobody would believe in my words. Giant bats. And I'm not talking about regular bats. These were massive, the size of humans. And what's worse, as I saw them in the light, they were human hybrids, part human, part bat. And they were devouring the body of a wolf with hands and claws and a face that looked like a demon. I panicked, running faster than I could. These things saw me, flying off in the sky and taking my direction, almost trying to catch me. The woods were dark, and my light only prevailed through so much darkness. I entered a small cavern that would provide me ample coverage. I guess you can call it a cavern. It was more like a little outing in the wall, but they were flying in the air, looking for me. They looked like large, deformed black dogs, taller than humans, with red eyes and long tails. I shot at one of them, and they came screaming in my direction. I waited for the right moment to run, returning back when I had arrived. I could still hear them flying around in the distance. I told everybody to keep quiet, immediately radioing my boss, telling him we have an issue. He asked that I speak with him in private as it sounded like he kind of already knew what was going on. When I spoke to him, he threw some paperwork in front of me and told me to sign it. It was an NDA he looked at me and told me, this is not going to be the first time you have to sign these. Better get used to it on this job, which is why I have to be very careful with my identity. At the beginning of this story, I told you my name was Dean. Obviously, I'm sure. You've already guessed that's not my real name. It's merely a placeholder. I guess there are several other rangers who have seen these same bats. What they are, I'm not sure. Could they be the elusive bat squatch? Possibly, but they looked far more hideous, and unlike a bat squatch, they were not covered in hair. They were far worse. Unfortunately, not everything is as it seems in these national parks, and many of these things we're told to keep quiet about. All I can say is, for anyone wanting to venture out at night, be very, very careful whether you're in a national park or not. Okay, let me start by saying, I'm a very detailed observant people person, so I'll explain what happened as concise as possible. It was 1985 and my second year in college, and I was living in an upper floor of a co-ed college dorm in Arkansas. It was going into fall, so the nights were starting to get just a slight chill. I came home late Friday night, more like the early hours of Saturday from dancing and partying with friends. My dorm had a private fenced-in parking lot in front and free to others type parking behind it. Since I came home so late, literally every spot was taken in the private parking lot, 
and I had to park my car down the hill behind the dorm. Saturday night rolled around, and even though I was still sporting a bit of a hangover, my friends talked me into going out that night. The private parking lot was lit with huge street lights, and so was the street that ran in front where the sidewalk led you to the back lot. I took off through the parking lot and stepped onto the sidewalk and noticed a couple arm in arm walking my way. I don't think anything of it other than I was going to have to step aside and let them by as I made my way past. Both were dressed like they'd already been out having fun. As I reached them and made eye contact in the somewhat dimmer light, he looked at me. His eyes were red. I don't mean the whites of his eyes. Like his whole freaking eye glowed red. I don't want to sound nuts, but it was like they were an animal's eyes reflecting in a spotlight at night. A glow. Then she glanced my way as I was passing and her eyes were exactly the same. A solid red glow. It freaked me out bad. I basically walk and ran to my car and went out to party. I didn't tell anyone because I figured they'd think I was seeing things. But I've never seen anything like that since. I guess I'd put it out of my mind until I was talking to my spouse one night and the memory surfaced like a nightmare. Of course, I'm not scared now. That was a millennium ago. I didn't know what they could have been, but it was also the way he continued to stare as I passed that really unsettled me. I don't think I was supposed to see that. My dad swears up and down that he saw something blip on the radar, while at sea in a way that meant it was traveling at ridiculous speeds. He was an anti-air and Miss Slee guy in us Navy back in the 70s and early 80s. Not paranormal, but he also told me about how when they came into port in. I think it was Romania, the KGB types would try to act like Saibis and ask them things like how much money the sailors made and such. Of course, my dad told them he owned like five sports car back home, made six figures, and that the missiles on his ship could accurately hit targets well beyond their actual range. I currently live in Springfield, Massachusetts, and in May of 1973, I was a West Marine. We did a battalion-sized exercise in an area of California known as Casey Springs. We were told that there were no roads to get there. We were inserted by helicopter. I was sent out on a midnight ambush with 15 other Marines. It was a computerized war game. It worked on the computer, and so they sent Marines out to see if it could be feasibly done. What we did was we were going after an aggressor force. We set up a linear-shaped ambush, shaped like an L. And when your victims walk into it, it's a computer kill. Well, we set up this ambush at midnight, and we had two individuals walk into our ambush. We opened fire with blanks, and as it turns out, we thought they were bears. So we scramble, shooting our blanks at these individuals, and they separated. One went one way, and the other went the other way. We got back to our PPB, which is our platoon-sized patrol base, and we told our lieutenant what happened. He radioed it to our commander. This was the first night of a four-day war game, and it was canceled. We were given orders to light a large fire, get a fixed bayonet, and stand on a 360 around our blazing fire. All through that night, we heard high-pitched screams. The only way I can describe it was that of a death call of a bear, and in the morning we had two helicopters come in with base game wardens and some other fellas. To this day, I don't know who they are. We were made to bring them back to the area where this happened. Two of the individuals walked where we directed them, and we were ordered to leave the area. And this is something the Marine Corps does not do. To cancel a computerized war game. There were over 3,000 Marines involved in this. The logistics and the money that was spent on this, and it was cancelled. Growing up, I lived in northeastern Arizona, literally about five miles south of the Navajo Reservation in Winslow. Naturally, being that close to the reservation or the Rez Skinwalkers were a huge topic of conversation amongst the locals 
and we all took it very seriously. Stories of personal experiences abounded. I was no different. My family had gone camping in a little spot about 50 miles or so south of town called Heart Canyon, near Wiggins Crossing if anyone is interested. We had been there all day and I was extremely familiar with the area as we had camped there 20 or so times before. So my parents let me just wander about alone in the woods. This was back in the early 90s. Anyway, I had some gijos that I had been playing with in the nearby creek. About 80 yards from our campsite, there were no other campers there with us. My mom had called me back to camp for dinner, so I left and ate played around camp for a while and realized that I'd forgotten my toys back at the creek. So I took a flashlight and headed back that way. I knew right where I had left them so in no time I found them and grabbed them up. As I squatted down to grab them on the edge of the water, a sudden urgency that I'd never felt before ran down my spine. I remember feeling frozen because of the fear. Like the little boy on Et when the alien comes out of the field for the first time, and he's trying to scream for his family. I looked up and pointed my flashlight to the other side of the creek and about 10 yards down the way. I saw something. At first, I thought it was a deer, but it was standing up, so I thought it may be a bear. But it was too skinny and did not have enough poofy hair. It skunked behind a tree and peered out slightly at me. I seriously was too scared to move. I had just read a bit about Bigfoot for the first time since it wasn't really popular in my area. I thought for a long time that that's what I saw. I finally had seen enough to gather my wits and scramble as fast as I could back to camp. I told my parents and they kind of dismissed it as my imagination. So I just stayed close the rest of the trip. About two years later, I was at my house. I had two dogs. They were outside dogs and lived their whole lives in my backyard. One night they went psycho, barking at first at something in the alley behind my house, then they both started whimpering. I had my window open slightly and one of my dogs straight up jumped up to the window, frantically chewed through the screen of the window, forced its way into the house, and would not leave the house for three days. Another time when I was about 13, we used to play night games in the town. Mostly there being nothing much else to do, we would walk around our neighborhood and act suspicious so the cops would come chase us around. And we run down the alleyways and hop into random folks' backyards to hide. Now it was extremely common to see an intoxicated Navajo or Hopi in the alley. So it was no big deal to see one in the alley behind my house that night as we we being two of my friends and myself ran from a police car hot on our tail. We saw him plain as day standing in our way. We ran around him and jumped into the nearest yard to hide. We waited for the cop to pass us and hopped back out. Literally about three minutes went by. We ran back the way we came, and as we got to the point where the drunk man had been, he was gone. In his place was a coyote sitting there watching us. We ran right past it, feet from it. And anyone who knows coyotes knows they will bail out way before you get close to them. This bugger held his ground and calmly sat and watched us run past him. We all freaked out and stayed inside for a month. My last experience was when I was about 15 or 16. My brother has a girlfriend who lives in a small community south of Winslow called Starlight Pines. About 25 miles-ish. Well, we went to see her one day. And as we drove out, about 15 miles out, we saw a native guy standing on the side of the road. This was quite odd because the res was north of town, and it was rare to see anyone on foot south of town, because it's just desert and forest for literally 80 miles. Anyway, we see this guy, he looked normal enough. Flannel shirt. Jeans. We got to our destination and hung out with my brother's girlfriend and her family well into the night when we decided to head back home hopped in his truck, a Chevy S10, and drove back the way we came. In the same spot, we saw the native dude, he was still there. I remember thinking, the dude is crazy standing out there all day and into the night, what's he doing? Right as we passed him, we heard a loud bang on the back of the truck. At first, I thought we hit an animal, but I hadn't felt anything that we'd run over. I turned around and looked out the back window. My brother started to slow down 
thinking there may be something wrong with the truck. In the brake lights, I see the native guy chasing after us. We are easily going 55 to 60 at this point as we were about to stop. The guy is in the road, feet behind us. I scream at my brother to not stop. Gun it, man. Gun it. He does and being a Chevy S10, it had a speed governor on it at 80. Two miles. This guy keeps up with us. We are seriously freaking out. I asked my brother what if we don't make it back to town or what about when we have to slow down once we get close. After those two miles that stretch forever, I looked back and he was gone. We got home, booked it into the house and told our parents. The next morning, I get up to head somewhere and look at my brother's truck thinking about the night before. I wondered what the loud bang was just before we started getting chased. Inspecting the truck, I found a handprint smeared in the dust from about two-third over to the right, then smeared to the right taillight. I never went there again. Sorry it was so long. But those are my experiences with what I'm convinced were skinwalkers. I'd love to tell you about an unsettling experience I had about four years ago in the fall. I was born in and still live in Lewisbury, Pennsylvania. My younger years were spent back near the old observatory around Moore's Mountain Road and Observatory Drive. Even then I could sense that that area was a little off. The woods were just not quite right, open fields seemed eerie, the roads never seemed to go the exact places you thought they did. Moore's Mountain Church boasted Spook Hollow, which was a logging road that just kind of petered out that reeked of being creepy. But let's get to the present. Most nights than not I will drive down to New Cumberland for a cold beer and some darts and one night in October 2012 was no different. On the return trip, not long after midnight, I was on Route 382 headed east towards Lewisbury. As I was approaching John Brenneman's place up on the right just before Brenneman Drive, I saw someone walking towards me along the side of the road. True, it was late, but it was rather mild for October, so it wasn't out of the question that someone might be walking along the road. What was odd is that he was quite tall, six feet six inches or taller, and really, really thin. In the few seconds I was looking at him, I noticed that he seemed to be dressed all in black, with black pants, a tight black trench coat, very, very dark skin, and short dark hair. He was either limping or having trouble walking, as I debated slowing down, maybe someone had had an accident. He dropped down to all fours and quickly scampered across the road in front of me. He has a face that was, as I said, gold black with a cross between human and canine face. And then, he was gone. When I got home, I hadn't really thought much about it. But over the next day or two, it really started to give me the creeps. I didn't say anything to anyone for a few days, then told a few close friends. Being self-employed and fearing derision, I was reticent to make much ado about it. Although I have always been an enthusiast of the paranormal, cryptozoology, ghosts, and such, I have always been a dyed-in-the-wool skeptic. I can't explain what I saw or begin to postulate what it was. I only know I saw it, and it creeps me out. A deputy sheriff responded to a call from a teen girl in a house in a rural area of the county he was working in. Her parents were in town, it was night, and she was having a sleepover. There were several teen girls alone in the two-story house. Girl told 911 operator someone was upstairs tearing up the house. Responding officer went up to investigate. Saw a big hairy biped trashing a room. It dashed to an adjoining room and fled through a window. He said it looked mean and had red eyes. He took the girls out to his patrol vehicle and went in foot pursuit of the animal. He could hear it running and growling through the woods. He soon realized it had led him into an open area he was not comfortable with, and he had told no one of his location. He went back to his vehicle. The parents arrived while he was interviewing the girls. He returned the following day with another deputy. 
Upon inspection of the side of the house, he noted huge gouges taken out of the siding where the animal had climbed up to the second floor to gain entry through a window. He walked toward the woods and could feel it watching him. It also became vocal, as if it were trying to lure him into the woods. He left and never heard any more reports from that family. This story was on a television show about haunted woods or something. I don't remember exactly the name of the show. It has been several years since I've seen it. I hope I recalled it accurately enough. Back in the late 70s and early 80s, I used to target practice in the sand and gravel pits and mountains around Sultan, Washington. Back in the summer of 82, I was target practicing one summer day and had an unusual encounter in one of those sand pits. I had a 3 by 12 powered scope on the 3006 with me on this day and was going though 100 rounds practicing shooting with both eyes open. I had just replaced the an empty clip with a new one. I took one shot out of the new clip and then noticed some movement out of the corner of my eye. I scoped in on the movement and saw what looked like a large hairy humanoid. The hair was just a shade darker than golden brown. I could see the body from about the waist up. It was standing at the top of the sand pit to the left of where I was targeting, calmly watching me. At first I thought someone had put up a cardboard cutout up there, and I scoped it out to see what I was actually seeing. While I was looking at it through my scope at it from a range of about 75 to a 100 feet away, it blinked and my first thought was Bigfoot. Then I remembered someone once told me there was a million dollar bounty on one of these creature, and I decided to cash in on said bounty. But instead of pulling the trigger I stared for maybe 35 seconds or so longer, and then put the rifle down. It seemed that I had tunnel vision, and I continued to watch whatever it was until it stepped backwards into the trees and vanished. Then I grabbed my rifle and ran for the spot it had been standing in. I got there and started looking for some evidence. No footprints, no hair, no stench, no evidence of any type. I searched for I would guess 20 to 30 minutes. I measured a tree standing next to what whatever it had been, and I had to grab he rifle by the butt and extend my arm as high as it could go to reach a point on the tree that had been next to the head of the creature, and it was eight feet tall give or take an inch. I double-checked the measurement with a tape when I got back to the car I kept tools in the trunk. After I realized what I almost did I got scared at what I had thought about shooting at. I decided to leave and came back to Seattle. It was just a couple years later when the memories came back to haunt me. I was watching Harry and the Hendersons and when I saw Harry I could not believe what I was seeing. The face of what I saw in the mountains was not as pretty as what I saw on TV but in general they looked the same. That is an awful chance to take, sneaking up on someone while in a costume who is shooting a hunting rifle just for a joke. And if it was someone in a costume they needed a good makeup artist to pull it off I was looking at it magnified through the scope on my rifle and could not see signs of makeup artistry. Was it someone dressed up in a Bigfoot suit or was it real? To this day, I don't know what I saw, but I know I saw it and I think I know what it was. The one thing I do know it was not a bear. I have hunted them and harvested them several times. On Sunday the 28th of February, my husband and I were out walking for a couple of hours in the beautiful sunshine. It felt like the first real spring day of 2021 here in Marsta, Sweden, a suburb just north of Stockholm. The area we live in is full of ancient structures, grave mounds from the Iron and Bronze Age, old Viking forts, runestones, and many other things. This day we decided to walk to what's left of ancient fort, up on a hill deep in the forest behind Stenage Castle. My husband is a photographer, and there's always time for a portrait, which I'm quite spoiled with after 14 years together. After checking out an abandoned old house near the road, he asked me to pose in the middle of the road for a shot, which I did. Later, after uploading it on Twitter, a follower asked me what was standing by the side of the road not far from me, and to my surprise I found it in my opinion a troll-like creature, 
merged with nature almost transparent. It looks like it's studying my husband, looking directly into the camera, slightly turned to my direction. Yeah, I'm aware of pareidolia, and that might be it. It's very similar to the trolls of artist John Bauer, actually, but also like a hunching Bigfoot. Maybe my eyes just want to see what they want to see, but even if it's just a splendid case of pareidolia, it's also quite creepy and organic. No matter what it is, I find it to be quite magical. There's something with nature spirits to me, at least I want to believe. On our way home, we also saw a strange phenomena in the sky. A bright shiny spot of cloud or something else with traces of a spiral-shaped movement around it. A fun and cool walk, not just only for the Stenange Troll, as I know call it and the UFO, but also because spring is finally coming, and if it's something us Swedes like it's a lot of sun and warmth. I have never told this story, nor am I sure I ever will again. This event happened to me in the fall of 1983, just south of Camp Lenape, outside of Medford, New Jersey. I was about 13 or 14 at the time. I was with the Boy Scouts and refused to subscribe to ghost or monster stories. I grew up in a family that knew and respected nature and all that it encompassed. My family moved to New Jersey from McCord Ave in Washington, after a brief stay in PA. I grew up hearing stories of Bigfoot or Sasquatch, whichever name is more recognizable. My father grew tired of all these stories coming from a child whose imagination was so influenced by tales of monsters in the woods, generated by drunks and individuals who loved to put a little fear into kids just for giggles. I always wanted my father to see me as a man, and was always willing to try prove myself as one. Growing up, my father had his career to the military and the country and had little time for kids, monster stories, though he would entertain us with feigned interest. When this occurrence had happened, I realized that this is what fathers do, and I was to grown up for such nonsense and monsters do not exist, hence my silence for close to 36 years. Most of my childhood, monsters under my bed, have long since been forgotten, except for this one and is why I have never stepped foot back into those woods since. I have seen true monsters in man throughout my 50 years of life, and have become somewhat bored of the other monsters in life, except this one. No matter how bad I try to explain it away, it still spawns a lump in my throat when I recall that one night and any remote thought of ever returning. There are periods in life that may have been scary to most, but over time those experiences become childhood memories. This one is still a very memorable and real, and no matter how much I have tried, it cannot nor will not be explained away. I returned to New Jersey in 1988, at 18 years old, for basic training at Fort Dix. I knew prior to my arrival there that my story would never be repeated because who wants a crazy person with a gun to defend their country? So it never happened as far as I was concerned. So after 36 years, this is the first time and most likely the last time I will ever allow it to pass through my lips. To those non-believers I say this. I don't care what you think, I am 98% positive what occurred that night, and would almost give anything for you to experience the same thing, and after 36 years see how you fare. I was as I said about 14 at the time and involved in the Boy Scouts. I was one of the older boys in the troop and knew that I had to conduct myself as one. I had a love of fishing and my world revolved around it. The area we were camped at was way out in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. Of course there were stories of this devil-like creature that haunted the barrens, but that's all it was, was a story. We set up our camps and established what duties needed to assign to who and when. After all the initial setups and assignments were established, it was time to knock out the half-mile trek or so to the river to fish. I had no duties to attend to that night, so my intentions were to pull an all-nighter of fishing. I had a couple of younger scouts with me until just about dark when they decided that campfires and s'mores is what was more important to them. I was expecting scare tactics and such, no campout is complete without them. My father was an avid outdoors lover and had taught me everything he felt was needed to know about being in the outdoors, 
from tracking to identification of wildlife by calls and other sounds. Growing up in Washington, my father had taught me how to discern size differences by sounds as well, so I knew the difference between squirrels and other small animals from larger animals such as fox and bears. It was a couple of hours after dark, and I decided that all-nighter wasn't going to cut it, and besides I was bored and hungry. I knew that my eyes were completely adjusted to the dark, that the trail was very visible in the sandy dirt going back to camp, and that I wasn't too far from camp because I could hear the other boys back in camp in the distance. I had no fear at the time because there was nothing to fear. As I continued down the trail towards our camp, I could hear a sound I was not familiar with, assuming it was the wind or something making this groaning-like sound in the trees. Still not scared in the least, I kept going thinking I'd have ammo for my own scary stories until I smelled something that didn't jive with the smells I was used to smelling there. The further I walked the stronger it got until I came around a turn in the path, almost completely on top of it. At first I thought I made a wrong turn, and this screwed up looking dead tree was in my way. I stared at it for a second thinking I saw it move, but knew I was mistaking. What in the world stinks like that? Is what was in my mind until this tree moved again only outwards like it was getting wider. Enough of this silly crap, let me find the right trail. I believe were my thoughts until I turned on my flashlight. It took a millisecond for it to register what I was seeing and a little longer for me to do a double take to make sure that I was seeing what I was seeing. This tree was not a tree, but a hideous looking cross between what looked like a rearing horse or donkey with it at first a glider. But no, they were wings stretching out just before it kind of jumped a little and went straight up through a small opening in the trees. I have no clue as to what it was and never made a hint to anyone what I saw nor will I ever again after this. Whether or not it was a figment of my imagination or not there was something there that was not supposed to be there. The following morning, after laying in my tent all night with an open knife ready to scream at the first sign of anything, and now feeling a fool, some of the other scouts wanted to go down to the river to fish. I started to go with them until we got to where I thought I saw what I wasn't sure of, not saying anything except that I needed to go pee, and that I'd meet everyone down at the river. I searched the entire area for anything to justify what I saw, only finding what looked like hoof prints located in just that little area, nowhere else. I asked the scoutmaster if we were going to have horsemanship merit badge training or just rides, or if anyone was out there with horses only to be told we were the only ones out there that weekend. I have never returned there, nor have I ever told that story and probably never tell it again. But rest assured that should I ever experience something that magnificent again, I'll be coming home. It will not. Okay, so this has been going on for a few months now, but things just went to the next level last night. I was about six months pregnant when this started back in October. We had only been living in this house for about two or three months and everything had been normal. The first few times it happened, I didn't think too much about it. I just thought it was a bird or something. The whistling always happens at night. It is one higher pitched whistle, a very short pause, and then a lower pitched whistle. I'll start with the first time I noticed there was something odd. I was probably seven months pregnant and my dog and I were napping on the couch. For whatever reason, while I was pregnant, I would moan in my sleep, sometimes so loud I would wake myself up. So I was asleep and I woke myself up moaning, and then I heard the whistling, but it sounded like it was coming from in the kitchen. I know I wasn't just hearing things because the dog shot up and looked in the kitchen with his ears perked up. After that happened, I had noticed that the whistling was only happening at night, and I have never heard a bird or anything else make this sound during the day. It started to become more frequent, but the dog and I were the only ones that were hearing it. I had told my husband about it, but he just kind of brushed it off. The second weird thing that happened was, at the end of my pregnancy, my husband and I were in bed. I was sleeping, and he was watching TV. I was moaning like normal. My husband said it was getting louder and louder. Then he heard the whistling and I stopped moaning. 
He woke me up to tell me this. After I had my daughter in January, the whistling had pretty much stopped until the last couple weeks. I have been hearing it almost every night and on Sunday my husband and I both heard it. Last night after my husband got home from work, he took the dog outside. We have a very long and narrow patch of trees directly across the road from our house. I was in the house. The windows were open, but the curtains were closed so I could hear, but not see. So according to my husband, the dog was peeing and really focused at the patch of trees. And then he saw a cat, but the cat was stalking something in the trees. After the dog was done peeing, he took off. At first my husband thought it was the cat, but something shot out of the trees. In the house I heard claws on the pavement, first really fast ones, then the obvious stride of our dog. I heard my husband yell for the dog to come back. When they came in the house, it looked as if my husband had seen a ghost. He said that whatever came out of the trees was pretty big, about as big as our dog who was a Doberman pincher about 110 pounds on all four. It ran so fast that he said that if he wasn't paying attention that he probably could have missed it. It looked more like a human though that was on all four. It was dark in color and jumped into the air and disappeared. All last night the dog did not want to be alone. Usually he sleeps on the couch, but my husband had to throw him out of bed. This morning my husband went outside to look in the trees to see if there was an obvious spot where this this has been living. When he went over to check it out, our neighbor whose yard backs up to the trees came outside, and when my husband told him there was something big there last night, the neighbor said, Oh, it won't hurt nothing. I can't help but think that this creature and the whistling are related. If anyone can help me figure what it is or what I should do, that would be greatly appreciated. My grandfather and all his siblings saw La Llorona and heard her. This was in Guatemala sometime in the 50s or 60s, I want to say. My great-grandparents were out dancing and my grandfather and siblings were home alone. The youngest three female was supposed to be sleeping, but they all heard her crying suddenly. So they went looking for her wherever she was crying. They found her in the back on the outdoor sink completely wet. They also saw a woman-like figure with her, but as soon as they got close enough she disappeared, and the three-year-old was left drenched alone and crying. There was no way she could climb into the sink, because those sinks are really big and difficult to get into, and she was very small. They also heard La Llorona weeping before and after. To this day everyone tells the story about how my Aunt Doris got bathed by La Llorona. I am 26 years old and have lived away from home for close to seven years. I grew up living with my mum, stepdad and little sister who is 13 years old. Last weekend I drove out and visited my parents and sister. I had some drinks with my mum and stepdad and just talked about life and work. I eventually realized I would have to stay at their place overnight because I couldn't drive due to the drinking. When I asked if I could borrow a pillow from my little sister, so I could sleep on the couch, she told me to just sleep in her bed because she was going to sleep on the couch. I insisted that I was fine to take the couch, but she told me she has been sleeping on the couch every night for around six months. I kept asking her why she would do that when she has a queen-sized bed and a really nice room, but she refused to tell me and started to get annoyed at me for asking. I was confused but decided she was just going through a weird phase or something and went to her room to sleep. I fell asleep pretty fast because I was very tipsy, then I suddenly woke up in a panic and I could hear drums coming from somewhere in the house. It was around 3 a.m. and everyone was asleep. I got up and left the room to see where the drum noise came from, but the house was silent. I got back into the bed, but I felt extremely uneasy and my heart was racing. I laid in the bed for around 15 minutes trying to fall back asleep when I heard someone breathing right behind me. My heart stopped and I was completely paralyzed with fear. The breathing was only for a second, 
but I was completely certain something was either standing over the bed or on the bed next to me. After a little, but I sat up and quickly turned on the light and found nothing in the room. I slept with the light on for the rest of the night. The next morning I woke up and made some coffee. My sister was eating breakfast at the kitchen bench and asked me how I slept and if I liked her room. Then she asked me if I heard anything. When I asked her why she would ask me that she just said, I don't know. I think she has experienced something in her room and was trying to see if I did too. I'm starting to think that's why she has decided to only sleep on the couch. My dad says he saw La Llorona in Mexico City. I believe him because he doesn't believe in those kinds of things or isn't religious or anything like that. It was late night. They had been out somewhere and were walking to my grandma's to pick up my brother. My mom was with him, but she never saw her, even though they were walking right behind her. My dad only saw her from the back says she had on a short white dress and long black hair. He told my mom she was crazy for being out so late, dressed like that in a rough neighborhood. My mom asked who and my dad was saying the girl right in front of them, but my mom was never able to see her. They followed behind her a little bit along a small creek thing and that's when she walked right into a tree and disappeared. In Ireland where I'm from, me and my best mate were walking back from football training one night. We went past an old house that the locals say is haunted, turned the corner, and we seen a girl who looked 19 or 20 on the far side of the road. She looked pretty and was wearing a white lace dress not from this century. My mate Aaron said hello to her. She just turned her head and stared at us with black eyes for a second or two. Then she turned her head straight ahead and kept going. He looked at me and I ran around the corner literally a second after she turned it. She was gone like a poof of smoke. We sprinted to his house which was a kilometer away and told his parents what happened. Scariest thing we'd ever seen. My husband and I had visited a wooded area outside of town. We were walking in the trees and I felt a presence of an animal or something watching us. We though maybe a fox or a bobcat. We turned around and walked out of the woods. A few nights later we decided to hang out on the gravel road by the same woods and look at the stars on a beautiful evening. We sat on the car. We were joking and laughing and making noise. We heard a screeching sound extremely close to us. It was loud with bass to it. This was not a barn owl, fox, bobcat, or any animal either of us had ever heard. My husband had grown up in that area and never heard this sound his whole life there. It petrified me with fear. I was frozen and screamed for his help. He opened the driver's door which was away from the woods and we both jumped in the car. We left the area and never returned. That night haunts my dreams. I have looked all over the net and listened to hundreds of animal sounds and have never found a match. The patch of woods was small and insignificant. Small patch between fields. Whatever this was, it was brave enough to come out of the woods at us, even though we were not quiet. I never saw anything. I was too scared. My husband said he saw green eyes in the darkness. I felt like prey that was about to meet its fate. We stopped walking in any woods that summer two years ago. My husband was just as spooked as I was, and he had been in all the wooded areas before. We saved up money and moved out of state. We are not people who are afraid of woods or animals. We moved to the mountains of the south and have never heard anything like that night again. This is the first time I have told this story publicly. Gad, me husband, and I had visited a wooded area outside of town. We were walking in the trees and I felt a presence of an animal or something watching us. We though maybe a fox or a bobcat. We turned around and walked out of the woods. A few nights later we decided to hang out on the gravel road by the same woods and look at the stars on a beautiful evening. We sat on the car. We were joking and laughing and making noise. 
we heard a screeching sound extremely close to us. It was loud with bass to it. This was not a barn owl, fox, bobcat, or any animal either of us had ever heard. My husband had grown up in that area and never heard this sound his whole life there. It petrified me with fear. I was frozen and screamed for his help. He opened the driver's door, which was away from the woods, and we both jumped in the car. We left the area and never returned. That night haunts my dreams. I have looked all over the net and listened to hundreds of animal sounds and have never found a match. The patch of woods was small and insignificant. Small patch between fields. Whatever this was, it was brave enough to come out of the woods at us, even though we were not quiet. I never saw anything. I was too scared. My husband said he saw green eyes in the darkness. I felt like prey that was about to meet its fate. We stopped walking in any woods that summer two years ago. My husband was just as spooked as I was, and he had been in all the wooded areas before. We saved up money and moved out of state. We are not people who are afraid of woods or animals. We moved to the mountains of the south and have never heard anything like that night again. This is the first time I have told this story publicly. I was with a group who hiked in Forbes State Forest, Fayette County, Pennsylvania along the Quebec Run Wild Area at around 1 a.m. This occurred in early September 2023. One of the members of our group let out a howl. We received an immediate response. A howl, then three seconds of silence, another howl, then another three seconds of silence. This was followed by a long howl, then about 10 seconds of silence, then one last short howl. The howls reminded me of an old firehouse horn from the town I grew up in. It was a clear code that had to have meaning. Shortly after that, we had eye shine to our right. Not far from that spot the next night, we took a dirt road to a small parking area, then hiked in on a trail that was not used much. We came across a nesting area with a few shallow footprints. There were pine trees that had been cut down by the state forest employees, and all the branches on those cut trees were literally ripped off the tree. These were four seven-inch thick branches. There is no human that I know of that could do that. We were growled at at one point. We finished by hiking the rest of the trail, which made a loop back to the parking area. We found a marker for some type of national or world hiking competition way back in the woods, which we thought was very strange. The moonlight was bright, and we all saw a Bigfoot move from one tree to another. It is a vast area, and once in those woods, it's easy to see how they could go undetected in an area not tracked by humans. I believe that the Bigfoot choose who they want to see or hear them in my opinion. Yes, some make mistakes and expose themselves. One last thing when we got back to our cars the second night we had placed rocks on the hood and fender of some of the cars, and in two of the cars some rocks were moved. Not knocked off, but moved to other areas of the vehicle that only something or someone with thumbs could do. I've been a member of this forum for quite some time, but I had never noticed the stories that users could submit until recently. I've never been privy to anything strange other than one occasion which I would like to relate here in order to see whether what I saw has been seen by others, or even perhaps if others have not seen it, if they could point me towards resources that might shed some light on what I saw. Around January 2001 it was after I got my driver's license, but before I went off to study, I was driving around with a friend of mine just chatting and catching up. We decided to call it a night and drove my car to an area that was close to our flats where I regularly parked. This was a semi-waste ground commonly called the Components Factory thanks to a light industrial area that was now defunct and beside the local coach park. Driving alongside the road we noticed a couple looking and pointing up at something that was floating above the coach park terminal building. At first glance, it literally looked like pieces of black rags that were suspended off the building. There was a noticeable gap between the roof and the rags. 
We parked the car and I asked my mate to run back with me to have a closer look at what that thing was. He wasn't having any of it and said that he wanted to go home. As peculiar as I found his lack of interest in this was, I understood that he seemed uneased about checking it out and accepted that he wasn't going to come along. I therefore ran on my own to the building to see that the couple had moved on and that the thing was no longer on top of the building but floating parallel to the ground at the same height that it had been when I saw it originally. I was able to take a closer look at it and here is where the story turns somewhat weird. What I saw was floating 8 to 10 meters off the ground height of the building plus then some. It looked for all intents and purposes like a small and long dog skull where I could make out the snout part and the concave areas of where the eyes should have been, in addition to at least one small canine, fang and protrusion coming off at the end of the snout. The rag seemed to be made of genuine fabric, but it looked like a cross between a hood and matted hair that started halfway into the dog skull and hang loosely for less than a meter in thick clumps. Whatever it was, I could only describe it as inanimate since it was just floating hovering is probably a better description away from the terminal. It made a beeline as the crow flies past a residential block and out to the nearby marina, where it went out to sea avoiding the long masts of the ships and their berths. I had to run around the building and up to the marina to see just float away. That was the last I ever saw of that thing and I've never experienced anything remarkable since or before for that matter. The next day, my friend only briefly acknowledged that we saw something whilst driving, but never wanted to know more about it. He moved out from Gibraltar to the UK shortly afterwards, not related to the incident, and haven't seen him since. I would certainly appreciate any input into what others think this may have been. I'm a relatively serious, professional individual and don't actively believe in the paranormal, but open to the possibility of unexplained phenomena. Finally, I want to be explicitly clear that what I saw certainly felt both real and out of place. Thanks for reading. I've always been fascinated by tales of cryptic lake or water monsters, though I've never actually seen one myself. But my stepfather's father an eccentric, yet sharp and to the point individual who ordinarily isn't given to making up fanciful tales, and whom I'll call Bill once recalled a time during World War II, when he was serving aboard a ship that may have been in the English Channel. He noticed a commotion one evening on deck, and when he went to investigate, many crewmen were carrying on. Those who happened to have cameras were eagerly snapping photos, though conveniently Bill didn't have one. What he claims to have seen was astonishing. A creature was traveling in the water in a perpendicular fashion, just slowly enough to frighten the crewmen into thinking that their vessel would collide with this beast. The creature, whose long back broke the water and looked something like a crocodile's, had its head held out of the water as it traveled, its incredible size was said to be even longer than the vessel itself. Bill stared open-mouthed. As he recounted, the vessel and the creature actually did come very close to colliding, but apparently the animal had a clear destination in mind. It simply kept on traveling without acknowledging the vessel or looking left or right luckily for those on board, and it was not seen to submerge. Crew members followed it with their eyes as long as they were able until it finally disappeared from sight. This did not sound like a crocodile to me, even a large one. When I pressed Bill for a better description, he stubbornly gathered his bearings and stated, Well, it looked like a dinosaur. That's all there is to it. A dinosaur. I swear to it. This was especially chilling to me. Randy Morgensen was an experienced backcountry ranger, having worked 28 seasons in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. He was intimately familiar with the High Sierra Wilderness, having explored it more than any other ranger. Dedicated to his job, Randy took his responsibilities seriously. On a summer day in 1996, Randy left a note on his tent, stating that he would be away for two or three days. 
Strangely, the date on the note was June 21st, not July 21st. Carrying only his backpack, he departed from near Bench Lake, leaving behind his Smith and Wesson 357 Magnum at camp. Unfortunately, Randy never returned, and he was never seen alive again. Randy Morgenson was one of many seasonal rangers who had been reapplying for their jobs every summer, with no medical benefits or retirement plan. They were a tight-knit group, referred to as the 14ers, as they had been returning to the park for over a decade, some even for two decades. Their reward was not monetary, but rather the beauty of the sunsets they witnessed. If a ranger were to die in service, their family would receive a one-time payment of $100,000, but no pension. Randy had written in his 1973 McClure Meadow Log, expressing his longing for adventure and the freedom to find his own path. Randy's life took a downturn as the 1996 season approached. His wife, Judy, decided not to join him on backcountry adventures after he had an affair with a fellow ranger named Lolinus. Randy's spirits were low, and he questioned the worth of his job after years of service. The divorce papers from Judy arrived, adding to his emotional burden. Randy's friends noticed his mood decline, and he confided in them about his thoughts of S. Then, on July 20th, 1996, he contacted his colleague and his wife on the radio, asking trivial questions. Their conversation abruptly ended with Randy stating, I won't be bothering you two anymore. The next day, Randy left his camp without a trace. The community was haunted by the mystery of Randy's disappearance. The circumstances left many questions unanswered. Was it an accident, foul play, or something more inexplicable, like an encounter with aliens? The search and rescue efforts were relentless, with rangers scouring the area for any sign of Randy. The search leader utilized a computer program called Cassie Computer Aided Search Information Exchange to track the effectiveness of each segment searched. However, weeks passed with no leads and morale began to decline. The rangers were determined to find their beloved colleague before it was too late. Ranger Rick Sancher, a second year backcountry ranger, hiked through the night to Randy's duty station at Bench Lake. There, he discovered a note confirming Randy's overdue status from a cross-country patrol. Anxiety grew as everyone wondered what had happened to their veteran mentor. The investigation into Randy's disappearance uncovered two separate threats of violence made against him. However, neither person had an alibi for the time of Randy's disappearance, leaving the case without a clear suspect. Speculation ran rampant. After 13 days of searching, hope started to dwindle. Then, in a remote gorge, five years later, a worker stumbled upon fresh evidence. It was a breakthrough. Rangers were summoned, and they discovered Randy's shirt bearing his badge, his backpack, and a boot half submerged in water. Excitement turned to horror when a leg bone was found in the boot. The evidence matched Randy's reported gear. Despite the discovery, the search for answers continued. Retired Sierra Sub-District Ranger Alden Nash believed that Randy had stumbled through a fragile snow bridge and fallen into an icy abyss, breaking his leg. He theorized that Randy's body remained hidden beneath the snow for days while search parties combed the area. Judy Morgenson received a letter after Randy's disappearance, but it arrived two days later. This added confusion to the mystery. The search for Randy yielded no definitive answers, leaving his family and colleagues yearning for closure. Randy Morgenson's fate remains a haunting mystery. Speculation and theories abound, but the truth eludes everyone. Despite the passage of time, the unanswered questions surrounding Randy's disappearance linger, forever reminding us of his enigmatic vanishing. I was walking my dog last summer because we'd been driving all day and I wanted my husky to get some energy out before we went home. It was summer in Alaska, so it's not like it was particularly dark, but midnight here is more like twilight. 
We were going off the main trail that laps around a lake because it was a late, and while she was off leash doing her thing, I wanted to be on a clear path just in case. There's quite a few homeless camps tucked in the back of the park, but none around the trail, so I assume we'll be fine. There's one part of the trail that's a little more claustrophobic if you're a woman walking alone at night, so I jogged through it to get it over faster. I haven't seen my dog in a while. I don't hear collar jingling or leaves rustling. I assume she lost track of me because I changed my pace. I call out to her. Out of the silence, I hear a yelp. I panic. She must be hurt. I assume the worst and I head back toward the small trail to go find my baby. I get ten feet in and she finally runs up to me, super upset and missing her collar. She's a Malamute, my dudes. I can't get her collar off when I'm trying without pushing piles of fur out of the way. I'm not saying someone messed with my dog, but that collar didn't get caught and fall off on its own. I was at the summit of a local mountain when it hit me. I couldn't get back down before dark and I had no light. After climbing back down to the hiking part of the trail, I began to jog. I was making good time when I went down hard, skinning my knee and shin. I got back up in some degree of shock and started again. I finally got to a point in the trail where I realized I would make it out by twilight, so I stopped to give my bloody leg some first aid. After washing the injury and treating it with an antiseptic, I got ready to bandage it. On the other side of a row of willows, maybe ten feet away, I heard and saw a huge mountain lion quietly slithering their way back up the mountain. While I was tending my wound, the area was totally silent. That sumbitch must have been watching me for a good five minutes. I can still recall the hair on the back of my neck sticking up and the weird adrenaline taste in my mouth. I haven't hiked without a firearm since. Since I was a child, I knew something about this universe and understood it in a way that I could not explain to others. The one who visits me doesn't speak and everything this organism has shown me has made me feel not at odds with mankind. This place is an illusion and it was created in a way by the place they come from. It's done so scientifically and they observe us as energy, frequency and vibration sort of left to its demise. Time for them is different from what we consider time. When I'm there, I've watched half a million years of evolution here and about a year's worth of what we call time. Our universe is held together by these beautiful rods that keep it stable. This alien has explained that everything is a copy of a copy, that their universe was made, and they are also watched. I know better than to tell therapists or people what I know I've experienced. At one visit, I was able to see how they had created our universe, and it reminded me a lot of what we have as the Large Hadron Collider. Unknown to us, and it will remain unknown for many lifetimes, we never die. Our energy comes back here is that we will also recognize that we have the knowledge to create the universe. But I never get to know if we just observe as they do. They have watched us evolve over millions of years, which to them has been 14, 17 years as far as I can understand. There are gateways here, on Earth, but they are often found and then closed. The area I was shown was South America, which had the most prevalent doors. I know I am not separate from anything in this universe, and that they have a different time understanding why we act and do the things we do. To them, it's senseless and almost an embarrassment because they know what we are truly capable of doing. As a 42-year-old female, I don't age, and I don't put effort into not aging. I know the two who came for me gave me this gift, and I know why. I live my life very carefully and have dedicated my time to quantum physics, astrophysics, and healing for mankind. It's all I'm capable of doing as myself at the moment. I'm not the only one. There are a lot of us. We tend to be tall and thin and people are attracted to us by our energy. My blood type is O negative and I descended from them when a few passed through the gates and didn't go back. 
I wish I had more time to explain things and the beauty in all of life, but I don't. Not here, not now. I'm not crazy. I am not traumatized by them or their visits or my visits. If I could emphasize one thing, it would be that right now we are in an interesting place to make changes and see truths we weren't taught to see. Here it's a thousand years at most, there a day or two. They do not influence us, but more so pity us because we are capable of doing so much more in our moment. We don't have the ability to see what is real. It is kept from us for a small number of individuals' greedy interests. Even those small percentages cannot see through the illusion that they created. I'm only one person here. There I'm everything and everyone, so there is no lie to be sold. They are not very forthcoming about what or where I get to go once my energy fades elsewhere. But I do believe in the next phase they will be with me and guide me as in this one. This story dates back to 2009 when I was 45 years old and living in a home I owned in Boca Raton, Florida. I am an educated business professional who enjoys reading about paranormal things, but never really had any encounter to speak of. It was early in the afternoon, and I had a friend over who was helping out with some electrical work on the second floor. I walked away for a moment down the hall when all of a sudden I heard a voice whisper directly in my ear. You're going to be arrested. I immediately felt weak to my knees and nauseous and got slightly dizzy. It felt as if something or some energy field had traversed right through me. I swear it sounded as if a person had leaned over and spoken right into my ear. But of course, no one was there. I had no idea what to make of the message or the experience. I sat in my downstairs office, bewildered by what just occurred. I started to nervously fidget with things and picked up an old ski mask I had lying there. I don't know why, but I shoved a white paper plate into it, drew rather angry eyes in its sockets, and leaned it upright against the wall on my desk, staring at it, but not aware of a reason why I did that. My friend came downstairs, but I didn't mention anything about what had just happened. Frankly, I wouldn't have known how to relate it. Two days later, at about 6 a.m., my doorbell rang. A short young man stood there and said he crashed into my garbage cans, and if I got a hefty bag, he'd clean it up. I was half asleep, not cognizant of how weird this was, and made my way to the garage. I hit the door opener button, the door started to rise, and then I was bum-rushed by a dozen camouflaged men pointing M16 machine guns at me. I was tackled to the ground, handcuffed, and dragged out front. Now wouldn't you know it, all of these guys had on ski masks. In fact, there were about 50 officers from the DEA, FBI, and Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office, all of them masked. It turned out that a particular individual whom I rented a house in another town had been caught making drugs there, and that lowlife told the cops it was my operation, just to save his own skin. They came to my house thinking they were going to find Pablo Escobar or a Walter White type. I wound up spending a night in jail before anyone could get me out and sort out the mess. All charges were dropped, of course, but I think some angel or otherworldly being saw this coming and tried to warn me. Because I didn't have any clue as to what was going on at my rental property, and there certainly was nothing going on in my own life to validate a fear of arrest. Some entity knew it was coming and more or less just told me so. It didn't really help in any way. I will never forget that voice, although it was no one I could recognize. When I was a very young child, like six or seven, I wandered off from my parents at a picnic in the Australian bush. The thing you need to understand about the Australian bush is that the forests are really dense and really messy, making it extremely difficult to move through, not even mentioning the fact that basically every animals you come across will kill you. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it was really common for kids to go missing in the bush, 
and never be found again because it was ridiculously hard to search the bush and extremely easy to be killed. Well, by some miracle, after seven hours of searching with police and the local town, I was found completely unharmed. But the whole ordeal was really scarring for young me, and to this day I still can get anxious when thinking about that day. The Australian bush is just something else. I watched in boredom as yet another drop of sweat ran down my forehead and landed with a splash onto my rifle. This was my first time holding a gun, and I hadn't anticipated how heavy it would be. I looked over to my colleague who, in the blistering midday sun, frantically applied sunscreen to his pale English skin. Glancing down, I scanned the forest floor below the dense jungle canopy fixing my gaze on the large chunk of elephant meat we had placed as bait. We had been sitting up in that contraption for hours by that point, waiting. I believe it's called a tree stand, but by its size it might as well have been a small watchtower. In case you're unfamiliar, a tree stand is a small platform that hunters attach to trees in order to gain a high vantage point over their hunting ground. The tree stand we were waiting in consisted of a fairly large rectangular platform with metallic rails running around its edges. How these grunts managed to install this thing all the way up here is beyond me. Damn mosquitoes, Dr. Burnsby, my boss, blurted out under his breath as he squashed the bug under the palm of his hand. I already knew he wasn't cut out for this environment. Burnsby was a veterinarian based out of Oxford. He specialized in the treatment of exotic animals, specifically reptilian and avian species. Though, I quickly came to realize that his specialization came strictly from within the comforts of a lab or a clinic, and not from the actual field. I was, at the time, a 25-year-old grad student, and had been working part-time as Dr. Fernsby's research assistant for a few months before he requested I accompany him on this expedition. Even prior to meeting him for the first time back in January, I was already familiar with his work. He was a talented veterinarian and a proficient animal consultant to a number of wildlife preserves and zoos worldwide. It came to me as no surprise when I heard how adamant our employer had been that Dr. Fernsby be on board with the project. The doctor was the best at what he did. With a series of sudden and loud metallic thuds, my eyes quickly darted over to the large container fastened on the back of the flatbed truck that had arrived with us. It started shaking, violently bobbing from side to side with each thud as if something within was trying to break free. The only things that kept the crate in its place were two sets of yellow ratchet straps, which seemed to loosen ever so slightly with each bang. The fact that the container hadn't fallen off during the treacherous ride over was a miracle in itself. Then two men dressed in camo pattern tank tops and cargo pants promptly exited the vehicle and made their way toward the shaking container. They each had something long and black in their hands, but from the distance they were at, it was hard to make out details. What do you think they have in there? King Kong? I asked Dr. Fernsby, trying to make light conversation. We hadn't spoken to each other a lot these past three hours. Huh? He replied confused, cocking his head to look at me. It seemed as if I had broken him from some sort of trance. In there, that container. I said, pointing toward the truck. Oh, he said, I don't know. I looked to my side at the other man up in the tree stand with us. A big game hunter from South Africa named Arno. I didn't know much about him, except that he had a reputation of frequently hunting large endangered mammals like elephants, giraffes, rhinos, and even lions on some occasions. All for sport. From the moment I met Arno, I could tell Dr. Fernsby took a dislike to him, and so did I. Arno sat completely still, looking through the scope of his rifle, unfazed by the extreme heat and excessive insects. I wondered whose genius idea it was to pair a couple of veterinarians with a trophy hunter. Then, a loud humming, like that from an engine, gradually grew louder and louder. I figured I would soon get the answer to my question. 
I looked back over to the two men in tank tops beneath us. They had now climbed onto the back of the truck. They each unlocked a series of hatches on the container and inserted the black object through one of the various openings. A chorus of loud crackling sounds emanated from the container, along with rapid flashes of blue light. For a moment, the thuds from within became more aggressive than ever, almost knocking one of the men over. But as the crackling continued, the container gradually calmed down. The thudding died out, and peace had once again returned to the jungle. The low hum of the approaching engine also came to a stop, and the sound of a car door opening and closing could be heard below. It had been very clear from the start that these guys weren't involved with any kind of wildlife preservation group, as they had said they were when they first reached out to us. When masked men wielding assault rifles greeted us at the runway immediately after stepping off the plane, I knew Dr. Fernsby had made a serious lapse of judgment in coming here. Though, the fact remained, they hadn't hurt us nor treated us badly. Not yet anyway. If anything, they were quite accommodating. These men were surprisingly well-spoken and mannered, despite their frightening appearances. The platform started shaking as someone had begun making their way up the flimsy rope ladder. I looked down below me and saw a figure rapidly ascending. Apologies for the wait, gentlemen. The man panted as he had reached the top of the ladder. He stretched out his hand and introduced himself as Mr. Adebio, our employer. He was a tall and handsome African man who, despite the intense heat of the jungle, wore a white three-piece designer suit. I am pleased to see my men were able to transport you here safely. I do hope you had a pleasant ride. The eccentric man said with a smile. I looked down at the deteriorated Humvee we arrived in and scoffed. Mr. Adebo's gaze shifted toward Arno. Specifically, his rifle. Arno took notice. Don't worry, Carfentano. Arno said reassuringly in a thick South African accent. Confused, Mr. Adebo raised his eyebrows. Tranquilizer. Arno added removing a cylindrical dart filled with clear liquid from his vest and holding it up. Good. Mr. Debo replied. And those? He gestured toward the munitions belt tied around his shoulder. It was filled with all kinds of bullets, from low caliber to high, and everything in between. Plan B, Arno said. Mr. Debo pointed over to me and nodded toward my rifle. And what about him? He asked. Tranquilizer as well, sir. Arno replied. Gave it to him this morning. Pleased with the answer, Mr. Debo stepped back and smiled. I can't stress enough how important it is that we bring it in alive, gentlemen. Unharmed. That is why you two are here. Adebo said and pointed to Dr. Fernsby and I. If anything should go wrong, I trust your expertise within this field should come in handy, Doctor. A brooding and quizzical grimace formed across Fernsby's face. And exactly what are we supposed to be bringing in here? He inquired. Lions? Bigfoot? Adebio chuckled. Oh, I can't do it justice by describing it, Doctor. You have to see it with your own eyes. Besides, I wouldn't want to spoil all the fun. You might not dare to stay the night otherwise. Adebo said with a smirk. Don't you think it's important that we know what we're looking for? Arno questioned with a hint of irritation in his voice. I could tell he wasn't one to play games. Oh, trust me, you will know when you see it. Adebo once again vaguely replied. He took a step forward and continued. Livestock found killed a village in ruins, and four people reported missing. This is not a creature from our world, I can assure you of that. I exchanged concerned looks with Dr. Burnsby. Without saying a word, I could tell that he only had one thing on his mind. This guy is crazy. Now, any more questions? Adebio asked. Yet again, a loud metallic thud filled the air and sounded throughout the jungle and I could hear the men in tank tops shouting at each other. What's in that cage? I asked, pointing down at the container on the truck below. Call it. Plan B. 
Adebo smirked and winked at Arno before he turned around and walked toward the ladder. It will be night soon. I expect all will be revealed sooner rather than later. And with that, Mr. Adebo climbed down the ladder, got in his jeep, and drove off through the dense vegetation until only the humming of his engine could be heard. And then, that too faded away. The three of us looked at each other perplexed, though we didn't say a word. Arno got back into position and resumed scanning the jungle for movement. As long as I'm still getting paid, he sighed. As time progressed, the shadows drew longer, and the beautiful orange hue dyed the evening sky. Yet, there was still no sign of whatever animal we were looking for. The chunk of elephant meat we had placed out hours ago had started decomposing, and a foul stench radiated throughout the rainforest. As far as I could tell, Arno hadn't moved at all during the past couple of hours. I almost refused to believe he was human. I looked down to the two men by the truck below us. They had set up a couple of hammocks in which they had fallen asleep an hour ago. Things seemed to quiet down in the jungle as well. Fewer birds were singing now, and I hadn't heard movement from within the cage in what felt like forever. As I sat in the evening sun, taking in the serene rainforest that surrounded me, a faint scratching sound came from directly behind me. Curious, I turned around and caught a shadowy glimpse of movement in the corner of my eye. I searched the nearby branches of the trees next to ours, but I saw nothing. Then the shadow appeared again from behind one of the branches of a tree no more than 15 meters away. Before I could get a closer look, it once again disappeared from view. Something was traversing the forest canopy at incredible speeds. Slightly alarmed, I stood up and walked to the back of the tree stand in order to get a closer look. Neither Fernsby nor Arno had cared enough to notice my commotion. The shadow moved again, leaping from one branch to another, and then disappearing once again. It was even closer this time. The low evening sun made it difficult to make out any details in the gloomy jungle. Then, a high-pitched screech filled my ears as I saw the shadow leap out from behind the tree and land on a branch just a few meters away. Fernsby had definitely heard it by now, and he turned around to see what was responsible for the awful noise. The creature growled, and in the dark shadows of the rainforest I could barely make out its features. It was sitting there, perched on a thick branch, holding something with both its arms, eating something. The animal was vaguely humanoid in appearance and covered in sleek black fur. Two bright specks of light reflected from the creature's large eyes. I inched closer to the metal rail on the edge of the platform in order to get a better look. Another shadow appeared on the tree to my right, and then another one on my left. Then another. The animal skittered across the canopy and drew closer to our tree stand. I felt a gust of hot air brush down the back of my neck, and I swiftly turned around to see a large dark face with grinning teeth staring directly at me. I'm ashamed to say the sight startled me so much that I nearly lost my balance and fell over the guard rails. Up close, there was no mistaking the identity of the creature. It was some species of monkey or ape. And up close, it was rather cute as well. Fernsby chuckled. Bonobo, he said with a smile. Probably juvenile, judging by its size. I stretched my hand out to pet it, but Arno protested. For the first time since Mr. Adebio had left us, Arno moved. He turned around and looked me dead in the eye. Don't touch it. They are a nasty and vicious sort. You're better off leaving it alone. He warned me as he rolled up his sleeve and showed off a thick line of scar tissue that ran down his forearm. You don't want to lose an arm, do ya? Though feeling that he was somewhat over-exaggerating the inherent danger, I still retracted my hand and took a step away from the innocent-looking ape. For a brief moment, the three of us all stood in the rapidly fading sunlight and stared curiously at the troop of apes. Dr. Fernsby watched in awe as the apes jumped around and played with each other. Fernsby had treated a couple of primates at the clinic back in Oxford, but seeing them thriving in their natural habitat must have given him a sense of childlike wonder he'd forgotten he had. Suddenly, 
One of the apes froze and tilted its head. Its large, dark eyes widened and it began uncontrollably screaming. Soon after, the others followed. They had gone crazy by the looks of it. Something had startled them. The primates scattered across the trees and as suddenly as they had appeared, they were now gone. At the same time, a flock of exotic birds cawed and began rapidly flapping their wings in unison, flying above the canopy, away from the forest. They too seemed to be fleeing from something. A wave of dread washed over me. The air felt thicker now and the atmosphere had taken on a more sinister tone. Behind me, I heard Arno curse quietly under his breath. And then he cursed loudly. What's the matter? Dr. Fernsby asked, but to no response. Arno picked up his rifle and frantically scanned the forest floor below. No, 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 he blurted out. I placed my hand on his shoulder and asked him what the problem was, but again, he paid no attention to it. Damn it, Arno, just talk to us. What's wrong? I shouted at him, greatly annoyed by this point. The meat, Arno finally said. Confused, I further inquired, meat? What are you talking about? The elephant meat, the bait we placed, he replied. What about it, doctor? Fernsby asked worriedly. Well, bloody look at it. It's gone. Night fell swiftly in the jungle, and a thick cloak of darkness had draped itself over the clearing we had been watching. The only light visible came from the faint rays of moonlight that occasionally shone through the jet-black overcast above. For the past twenty minutes Arno had been fumbling with one of the field radios he carried, trying to get into contact with the two sleeping mercenaries below us, but it was to no avail. Even if they were awake, I doubted we could get the radio working and get into contact with them. Whenever Arno tried broadcasting, only static interference could be heard coming from the other end. At one point he even changed the channels in order to get into contact with Mr. Adebio. But the signal didn't seem to be strong enough, as he received nothing but static. Maybe it's due to those clouds, Dr. Fernsby theorized pointing up at the dark storm clouds that drifted closer by the minute. I can go down there, if you'd like. Wake them up. I offered, but Arno protested, saying it wasn't worth the risk. Hey, Arno abruptly shouted, breaking the calm silence of the forest. He waved his arms up and down and shouted again. Fernsby shushed him and tried to get him to calm down. You're scaring it away. Stop that, he warned Arno. Down below there was movement in the two hammocks. It worked. Shut up, Fernsby said again. You're scaring it, the animal, you're scaring it. Arno stopped once he noticed the two mercenaries were now awake and he had gotten their attention. He turned his head toward the doctor, or attracting it. He responded to Fernsby. The men in tank tops promptly rushed to their radios, but only the crackle of static could be heard. With a greatly over-exaggerated gesture, Arno pointed over to where the bait had laid. The men turned and now too noticed that it had disappeared. One of them raised his hand and gave us a thumbs up, while the other walked to the back of the flatbed truck and started unlocking the hatches on the container. What are they doing? Fernsby asked Arno, who just simply replied with, Plan B, I presume. The large metallic door of the cage swung open, and the other man walked over to assist. They each grabbed a large chain and started tugging, pulling whatever was attached to it out of the cage. Meanwhile, I noticed three large drops of water splashing down on the railing in front of me, followed by a loud rumbling and an additional two more drops. Down below, a deep growl could be heard as the two men had dragged whatever resided in the container out into the forest clearing. Attached to the chains walked a large dark figure on all fours. Clearly the two men must have given it some form of anesthesia, otherwise the animal could easily escape from its confines. Instead, the sedated animal walked slowly and without rhythm. It looked as if it could fall over at any moment. Once the men had pulled the animal out into the middle of the clearing, they each took their chain and bolted it down into the ground on opposite sides binding the animal in place. 
A ray of moonlight shone through the thick clouds above, and we could now see the creature clearly. The poor animal was a large silverback gorilla, grotesquely tied down by massive chains on the forest floor below us. It was being used as bait, live bait. I could see that Dr. Fernsby was furious. He turned to Arno and profusely yelled at him, but Arno shifted the blame. He didn't know what plan B entailed either. Though he wasn't directly responsible, I could see in his eyes that he had no remorse for the poor ape. He had probably hunted worse, done worse. The slow patter of raindrops on the triangular roof of the tree stand had started picking up its pace, and streams of water ran down its corners. The rain combined with the Inkai blackness of the jungle made it hard to see what was going on in the clearing. A loud wailing sound could be heard from the gorilla, and as the two men walked back to the truck, the animal let out a soft whimper. It was heartbreaking, but there was nothing I could do. Not from up here, not with these men, and not in this rain. The mercenaries proceeded to climb inside the front seats of the truck to seek shelter from the rain. Can you see anything? I asked Fernsby, who promptly replied with a firm no. The storm picked up, and seeing through the thick wall of the torrential rain proved impossible. Besides from the heavy splashing of downpour, the only sound that could be heard in the jungle was the cries from the chained-up ape. Night vision goggles, bottom compartment. Arno said and tossed a damp canvas bag over to me. Give me a pair as well. The jungle lit up in a bright green fluorescent light as I put the goggles over my head. An electronic whirring sound emanated from the device. Though the rain still made it hard to see, I was able to get a view of the whole clearing now. I could see the gorilla, sitting on the wet mud, tugging at its chains, trying to break free. It wailed through the rain. Then a familiar stench crept its way up my nostrils. The smell of decay. The same smell that just hours ago had polluted the fresh jungle air. I recognized it to be the scent of the decomposing elephant meat. But that was impossible. It had been gone for quite some time. However, now it was back, and it reeked stronger than before. I swiveled my head back and forth, scanning every tree and bush that surrounded the clearing. No signs of life, and no signs of the source of the smell. A deep rumble sounded throughout the rainforest, quickly followed by a flash of lightning. With the night vision goggles, it was almost blinding. I rubbed my eyes and then put it back on, continuing to scan beneath the canopy. Ever so slightly, the tree stand trembled. At first I thought nothing of it, until it shook again, harder this time. I asked Fernsby and Arno if they had felt it too, but they brushed it off as being the workings of the wind. Satisfied with the answer, I went back to keeping watch, until the foundation of the stand was yet again hit with a powerful vibration. A faint boom sounded, followed by the tree stand once more swaying back and forth. That didn't sound like thunder. I whispered to the doctor. The wailing of the gorilla filled my ears, and I focused my gaze on the poor primate. It seemed alarmed. The gorilla desperately tugged at its chains. The goggles whirred as I zoomed in on the animal. The ape was intently looking behind itself, over its shoulder. And then it looked up, toward the wall of dense green foliage. You see that? Arno asked, tapping me on my shoulder. I adjusted my goggles and looked in the direction he pointed me at. At the edge of the forest, slightly to the left behind the gorilla, the tree line swayed unnaturally fast compared to the rest of the surrounding plants. Tall palm trees and large bushes got pushed from side to side, and the dense greenery made loud cracking sounds as if a thousand twigs had snapped at once. Something big was moving through the underbrush. Jesus, what is that? I asked Arno, to no response, who quietly chambered a round into his rifle and motioned for me to do the same. Even with the deafening splattering of rain, I pulled the bolt on my rifle back as quietly and slowly as I could. Having noticed all the commotion, Dr. Fernsby inquired as to what was going on, but he was quickly shushed by the concentrated hunter. Another deep rumble sounded, and the tree stand once again shook violently, and then another, 
followed by yet another. Whatever it was was coming closer. With each vibration, large ripples formed on the puddles of mud down below, and the distressed gorilla, fueled by adrenaline, hopelessly pulled at its chains. What is going on? Please just talk to me, Dr. Fernsby demanded in a frustrated manner. For the last time, be quiet, Arno hissed at the doctor. The sound of a large branch snapping and half shot past the noise of the heavy downpour. And through the thick rainfall, I could make out a large shadow slowly emerging from the vegetation, about seven meters above the gorilla. I zoomed in with my goggles to get a closer look at the shape. I think Arno did too, as I heard his goggles emit a low whir. There, high above in the tree line at the edge of the forest, right behind where the gorilla sat, an enormous scaly snout had emerged from the leaves. Attached to the long snout were a set of large, sharp serrated teeth. It almost resembled the snout of a crocodile, except this was way more rounded and broad in its design. The rest of the head was still concealed behind the dense foliage, making it impossible to get a better look at the rest of the creature. In the bright green of the night vision goggles, I could see vents of steam shoot out of the beast's nostrils as it exhaled. You ought to see this, doctor, I said, taking off my night vision goggles and passing them over to Fernsby. He put them on and searched around in the darkness for a while until he abruptly stopped and gasped. Even without the goggles, I could still make out the dark shape of the creature's snout poking out of the tree line just over a hundred meters away. Remarkable, Fernsby proclaimed, trying to zoom in with his goggles. A new species of megafauna, never before observed by the eyes of science. If we're lucky, we might get to name it, I jokingly said to him, trying to hide the nervous undertones in my voice. I could tell the doctor was awestruck, but I didn't quite share the same feeling. Sure, the creature didn't look like a threat from way over there, but that head was suspended high off the ground, maybe high enough that it could reach the tree stand if it came over here. No, I didn't feel a sense of joy at this new discovery. I felt horror. Faster than the blink of an eye, the large beast came crashing down through the foliage and wrapped its twisted jaws around the torso of the poor gorilla. I witnessed in horror as I saw the ape being lifted high up in the air by the monster. The gorilla's chains snapped as the large beast shook its prey from side to side. It then put the great ape down on the ground and began tearing off large chunks of its flesh. Due to the dark, I thankfully couldn't make out all the gory details. I looked over to Arno, who had raised his rifle in preparation of shooting the large beast. However, I could see that he too was terrified. Below, I could hear the nauseating sounds of flesh ripping and bones cracking. Just from its dark silhouette, I could tell the beast was massive. It stood maybe six or seven meters tall, or around twenty feet for you Americans. It seemed to be mainly bipedal although it alternated between using its massive forelimbs for support. The creature had a long and thick tail covered in scales, which it used for balancing itself. When it was done eating, it lifted its enormous head and sniffed in the air. Steam oozed out of its nostrils with each sniff. In the faint moonlight, I could see the reflective glistening of blood around its mouth. Had it caught on to our scent, it let out a deep snarl and took a few steps toward us. The ground shook each time one of the animal's powerful hind legs slammed into the ground. Give him the goggles, Arno whispered to Fernsby. He needs them to see what he's shooting. Fernsby handed over the goggles and once again, I quickly put them back on. In shades of nauseating green, I could see the monstrosity in way more detail now. A thick plumage of what looked like feathers covered its rigid back. My gaze shifted to the head of the creature. It had large reptilian eyes, like that of a snake, with small cartilaginous ridges rising above each eye socket, probably to shade them from sunlight during the day. Jesus Christ, what does a Debio even want with a freak of nature like that? Fernsby whispered. Power, I'm guessing. Arno replied. He is a warlord after all. There is no way he could ever get control over that thing, I shot in. Agreed. 
Then, to everyone's surprise, the headlight beams of the flatbed truck suddenly turned on and illuminated the right side of the animal. The large animal cocked its head and walked over to the vehicle in which the two mercenaries sat. No, 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 turn it off, turn it off, I heard Arno whisper under his breath, readying his rifle. Down below I could hear frantic shouting in a language I didn't understand. The beast lowered its head right besides the front door of the cabin and used one of its big eyes to peer in through the window. The shouting abruptly came to an end. The beast let out an ear-piercing roar, and in one fluid motion it swung its head and sank its sharp teeth into the metal exterior of the truck. It bit down and tore off the roof of the truck cabin. Arno and I raised our rifles and shot at the creature. It didn't even flinch. With my night vision goggles I could see the two men cowering in their seats. One of them unbuckled his seatbelt and exited the truck on the opposite side of the creature. The remaining man fumbled with his buckle, but couldn't get free. The creature cocked its head curiously to look at the trapped mercenary. I reloaded my rifle and took another shot at the beast. It had no effect. The creature came crashing down on the truck. The mercenary screamed as the animal ripped him from his seat and lifted him into the air. The screams came to a sudden stop as the beast raised back its head and swallowed the man whole. A loud shouting could be heard coming from the left side of the large animal. The other man stood out in the middle of the forest clearing. Mokul Mbemb, Mokul Mbemb, he shouted as he raised an assault rifle and took aim. Before the man could pull the trigger, the monster grabbed him with one of its forearms and raised him high over the ground. Arno took another shot. A loud crackle sounded, and a bright flash appeared around the man. The animal loosened its grip and the mercenary fell face down into the wet mud. He had used his stun baton to get free. The man crawled along the wet forest floor in an attempt to escape. The large reptile caught up to him and pressed one of its legs down onto the man's back, crushing him and leaving a massive three-toed footprint of blood and gore. It bent down to feast on what remained of the poor fellow. In unison, we both took yet another shot at the creature. This time it flinched and snapped its head toward the location of the tree stand. It bellowed in agony and began making its way to where we sat perched. Just as I was about to take another shot, my rifle jammed. I tilted it to the side to see that an empty cartridge had gotten itself stuck in between the chamber and the bolt, slightly poking out. In a panic I looked over to Arno, hoping he would know how to fix it. Pull the bolt back, damn it, he shouted. I did as he said, but it wouldn't nudge. I felt the ground tremble beneath me as the creature stood only a few meters away. In a panic, I dropped my rifle just as the powerful jaws of the animal bit down onto the platform. It shook its head from side to side in an attempt to detach the tree stand. I fell backwards on the floor, landing on my side. My night vision goggles slipped off my head and slid down off the platform, disappearing into the dark shrubbery below. The beast let go off the platform and instead walked to the side of the stand. It circled us for a while, snarling and growling while it was trying to figure out how to get to us. Then it stopped to our right. Somehow it had identified the support cables that held the tree stand in its place. It hissed and tore at them with its powerful claws until finally the sound of a taut metal cable going limp filled my ears with dread. Hold on to something. Dr. Burnsby shouted at the top of his lungs, just as the tree stand lost its balance and tipped over. I grabbed the metal railing and braced for impact, but it never came. We never hit the ground. The stand hung suspended at a 60-degree angle from one of the remaining support cables. Bags, boxes, and crates slid down the wet floor past me and fell down into the jungle below. The creature roared beneath me. It sounded like a chorus of rusty chairs being dragged across a concrete floor. I looked around to see that Dr. Fernsby held on to dear life by one of the rails on the opposite side of the platform, but there was no sign of Arno the hunter. Below I could see the open jaws of the animal snapping after my legs. I was just out of reach. Then, to my horror, 
The railing bent and bent until it finally snapped, sending me falling for what felt like an eternity. I hit the wet mud of the forest floor with a soft thud and saw that my colleague also lay beside me, unmoving and covered in dirt. Still no sign of Arno. I quickly rose to my feet and rushed over to help Fernsby when a large shadow cast itself on the ground beneath, ominously looming over us. I brushed mud and water out of my eyes to see the animal standing a short distance away, looking down at us. It cocked its head and I could see its raw muscles tensing in anticipation of leaping forwards. Then, someone's loud shouting filled the air. Arno stood in the middle of the clearing, holding his rifle. He waved one of his arms and continued shouting. He had managed to capture the creature's attention, and the large beast turned toward him. My ears rang as he shot at the creature. He wasn't using the tranquilizer darts anymore. The beast let out an agonizing roar and began running in his direction. Seeing my opportunity, I helped Fernsby get to his feet, and we made a run for the Humvee parked right beside the now-ravaged flatbed truck. Lucky for us, the keys were still in the ignition. I slammed my foot down at the gas pedal, and the tires began spinning, slinging mud in every direction before the vehicle finally started moving forward. Through the windshield I could see the massive beast standing in the middle of clearing, partially illuminated by the headlights of the truck. In the creature's mouth, Arno hung from his left arm, writhing in pain. A thick stream of blood ran down the arm and covered the hunter's body in a sickly shade of crimson red. The animal bit down and Arno fell to the ground. He clutched at his severed arm and cried out in pain. The animal's head then pummeled down, and the screaming finally stopped. I turned the car around and drove onto the dilapidated dirt road we had arrived on. Palm trees and jungle vines passed by as I floored the gas pedal. Behind, I could feel the ground trembling, and in the rear-view mirror I could see the beast giving chase. It took long and powerful strides, swiftly and elegantly running on its hind legs. It reminded me of the way a large terrestrial bird would run, like an ostrich or an emu. The large carnivore had started gaining on us, quickly covering great distances with each step it took. And then it stopped. It just stood there in the middle of the road. Had it suddenly decided to give up? Just like that. In the rear view mirror, the creature gradually began shrinking. It let out a final bellowing roar before it disappeared into the thick jungle by the side of the road. The rubber windshield wipers desperately wiped away the pattering rain on the glass of the Humvee as I continued to speed down the muddy thoroughfare. As we rounded a sharp turn, my eyes were drawn to the dismantled jeep that laid upside down in a ditch on the side of the road. Its tires were ripped off. The tail lights blinked a bright red and large claw marks ran along its side. Since we were moving so fast, I didn't get the chance to properly investigate the scene. But as I sped past, I could have sworn I saw a white blazer covered in specks of crimson hanging from a branch on a nearby tree. It took us no more than two days to leave the country and fly back to England. We didn't bother trying to report our experience to the local authorities back in Congo. We didn't expect they would believe us anyway and we definitely didn't want to get into any trouble. We packed our bags and left with the first plane available. Dr. Fernsby is still a little shaken up after the traumatic incident, but he is mostly fine. This all happened a few years ago, but I felt it was important we finally share what happened to us that fateful day in the humid jungles of the Congo Basin. As of late, I've seen news articles online detailing discoveries of ravaged towns in the Congolese countryside. The few remaining survivors blamed the disaster on an entity they call Mokal Mbem. When I first read it, I knew I had heard the name from somewhere before, and then chills shivered down my spine as I recalled the last words of the brave mercenary. In his final moments, he had called the beast Mokal Mbem as well. I've done some research and have come to find Mokal Mbem describing a large quadrupedal animal or water spirit that resides in lakes and rivers. Mokal Mbem is described as an herbivorous reptile possessing a long neck, like that of a sauropod dinosaur. 
Some people believe Mokul and Bemb is living proof that Mesozoic-era dinosaurs survived into the modern world, previously thought to have gone extinct around 65 million years ago. However, the description of Mokul and Bemb does not match the beast I encountered that night many years ago. The creature I encountered certainly didn't have an abnormally long neck, and it for sure wasn't herbivorous. This begs the question, are there more of them out there? Different species? Is there an undiscovered ecosystem thriving in the deep recesses of the Congo Basin, waiting to be discovered? According to the Congolese government, around 80% of the jungle around the northeastern part of the country remains uncharted. Who knows what mysteries are left to unfold? What wonders, secrets, and horrors are left to be observed under the watchful eyes of scientists? I've made attempts to contact Dr. Fernsby, but I have as of this moment not received any response. I'm using my university to try and raise funding for this next expedition, and so far the council seems to be on board with the idea. Of course, I haven't told them everything, not yet anyway. Ever since that night, I have had an obsessive compulsion to return to the jungle. The lull of adventure and discovery is calling upon me. I have to go back. I have to know if something has survived. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.